Good morning. Welcome to St. Paul Evangelical Lutheran Church. We have a very busy, wonderful morning, uh, not only with our wonderful Sunday school kids that are singing this morning, but the means of grace is going to be on full display today. So not only do we have a baptism uh, and some adult confirmations, but we also have communion. And then on top of that, God's word is preached in its truth and purity as always. We get to see Jesus displayed in three different ways and the power of the gospel in three different ways today. And so we are finishing up, fittingly, our worship series on the Trinity, how our God has revealed himself as three. Uh, three weeks ago, we celebrated Christ's ascension, and we focused on the Son. Two weeks ago, we celebrated Pentecost and the Holy Spirit creating faith in the hearts of those first Christians. Last week, we celebrated God the Father, and so this weekend, we celebrate God in his full nature as that God who gives both law and gospel. And so at this time, I would like to direct all of our eyes to that prayer upon entering the church that is found at the very bottom of the first page. And let's have a short moment of silence for meditation to get our hearts ready, and then we'll recite this together. We thank you, Jesus, for being God, giving us your law not to burden us, but to benefit us. But we not, cannot keep your law perfectly, and so we thank you for keeping it for us and giving us your perfect love. Help us meditate today on how you are Lord over all things, and so Lord over my life. Amen. Special welcome to any guests we might have. If you need directions to our washrooms downstairs or our nursery downstairs, we've got lots of fine people sitting next to you that are very willing to help, as well as some fine ushers in the back. At this point, though, I invite you to pick up the worship supplement, the blue hymn book. The blue hymn book turned to hymn number 747 to that beautiful song, There is a Redeemer, and we will sing the first two verses of that hymn. May God richly bless your worship this morning. The congregation may remain seated, and I direct your eyes to page two of your so service folder, the rite of holy baptism. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit to be with you. Our Savior Jesus Christ commanded baptism when he said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All of us are born into this world with a deep need for baptism. From our parents, we inherit a sinful nature. We are without true fear of God and true faith in God, and we are condemned to eternal death. 
But Jesus took away our sin by giving his life for us on the cross. At our baptism, he clothes us with the robe of his righteousness and gives us a new life. Our sinful nature need not control us any longer. We recall what baptism means for our daily lives as we speak these words. Baptism means that the sinful nature in us should be drowned by daily sorrow and repentance and that all its evil deeds and desires be put to death. It also means that a new person should daily arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. As baptized children of God, we confess our sins. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us, and he has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for all of our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jem Captan is going to be baptized this morning, and he has been in an adult information class for the last 15, 16 weeks with me and with Richard Martlock and with Lena Drahotsky, who is going to be received into membership. Jem is coming to us from Istanbul, from a Muslim background, and he read about Luther. But anyway, the, that's how we, he came to know us. You can get to know him better later. But we're sitting around during the last class, and we all know that Jim's going to be baptized today. And Lena says, who's going to be his sponsors? I don't know. So Lena and Richard Martlock, would you please bring up your new god child, Jim Captain, to be baptized into the family of Christ this morning? Stand right over here. Jim, by the power of the word, the Holy Spirit has led you to believe that this new life in Christ is now yours. Now in holy baptism, the Lord Jesus assures you of your salvation, that you may give public testimony of your faith. I therefore ask you, do you believe that you were born in sin and therefore eternally lost? Do you believe in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you believe that this triune God planned and carried out your salvation? Do you believe that God grants you the forgiveness of sins in holy baptism? Do you wish to be baptized today? So receive the sign of the cross upon your head and upon your heart marking you as a redeemed child of Christ. All right. Jem Captain, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Spirit. I'll give that to you. The Almighty God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has forgiven you all your sins. By your baptism, you are born again, and you are made a dear child of your Father in heaven. May God strengthen you to live in your baptismal grace all the days of your life. Peace be with you. I invite the congregation to rise. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, our Lord commands that we teach his precious truths to all who are baptized. Children love their, Christian love, therefore, urges all of us to assist in whatever manner possible so that Jem may remain a child of God until his death. If you are willing to carry out this great and awesome responsibility, then please answer, yes, as God gives me strength. Yes, as God gives me strength. We pray. Merciful Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessing of baptism by which you offer and grant the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. 
Help us to regard our baptism as the robe of righteousness we are to wear all the days of our life. Look with special favor on Jem and grant him a rich measure of your spirit that he may grow in faith and godly living. Make us willing to carry out, be willing to carry out our responsibilities to those who have been baptized so that all of us may finally come to the blessed joys of heaven through Jesus our Lord. Amen. The congregation may be seated. There you go. Congratulations. Our first lesson from scripture this morning comes from 1 Samuel chapter 21. So our theme this Sunday is that we have a triune God that is Lord over all and our scripture lessons especially draw our attention to how he is Lord over the law. And so here we see that God gives the law to benefit us, not burden us. And so we see that in need, David may eat consecrated bread, bread that otherwise the the Israelite law had prohibited from him to eat. David went to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. Ahimelech trembled when he met him and asked, Why are you alone? Why is no one with you? David answered Ahimelech the priest, The king charged me with a certain matter and said to me, No one is to know anything about your mission and your instructions. As for my men, I have told them to meet me at a certain place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can find. But the priest answered David, I don't have any ordinary bread on hand. However, there is some consecrated bread here, provided the men have kept themselves from women. David replied, Indeed, women have been kept from us as usual whenever I set out. The men's things are holy even on missions that are not holy. How much more so today? So the priest gave him the consecrated bread, since there was no bread there except the bread of the presence that had been removed from before the Lord and re replaced by hot bread on the day it was taken away. This is our first lesson. This is the word of the Lord. I invite you now to pick up your hymnals, the red ones. Turn to page 113. That's the small numbers in the very front. Small numbers in the lower corners. There on page 113, you'll find Psalm 126. And we'll sing this whole psalm together.
Our second lesson comes from Paul's letter to the Colossians chapter 2. And here we see that the same God who ordered those Israelites to keep those laws that we heard about in our first lesson, here we see that that same God sent Jesus to keep those ceremonial laws for us perfectly. Paul writes, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. This, too, is the word of the Lord. We'll turn now to our verse of the day. After the verse of the day, we'll join together in our triple alleluias. Alleluia. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Alleluia. love and respect for the words of our Savior, please stand. The Gospel according to Mark chapter 2. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. We'll join together now in hymn number 382 out of those red hymnals. That wonderful hymn, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So there's a brother and a sister in the back seat of a long car ride. And the car games have most certainly lost their novelty miles ago. And the little electronic game tablet that they have has lost its battery life long ago. And the iPad has now lost its charge. And this vehicle that they're riding in is so old that it is not equipped with a DVD entertainment system to keep the kids happy. So it's the son, the brother, it's always the boy, isn't it? The brother is like overcome with boredom. Probably because he didn't listen to his mother and bring a book along. But he's overcome with boredom, and so he starts tapping his sister's shoulder, and then her arm, and then her elbow, and then her hand, and then he goes up to her cheek, and he's just tapping, tapping everywhere, you know, tapping, and she says, stop it, stop touching me. Well, being a boy, he stops for about 90 seconds, and he starts poking her in the ribs, in the knee, down in the little calf, in her shoulder. And she finally has had it, and she says, stop it now. Stop touching me. Well, being a boy, he stops for a while, this time for about 60 seconds. And then he starts kind of blowing on her. And he makes his hand go like this, and he, he eventually takes her hand, and he starts flying her hand through the air like it's some kind of airplane. And she looks at him, and she says, what part of stop do you not understand? Now stop touching me. She totally loses it and blurts it out. Well, dad at this point catches his son's eye in the rearview mirror and makes it clear to him, stop touching your sister. Well. Being a clever lad and being bored as sand or watching golf on television, he, he puts his finger out like this and he moves it as closely as he can to his sister's cheek without touching her skin. And she says to him, stop it. And he goes, Stop what? I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. And he keeps repeating this over until dad says stop. Now, the point of all this is some people are clever enough to find loopholes in the law so they can use it to their advantage. Some people view the law as just a bunch of rules that are to be broken just because they can. But then there are those people who actually love laws because for them, they think that it gives them a very clear road by which to live their life. This morning, Jesus is going to help us understand the spirit in which the law was given to us. We read again, one Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? It's not like the disciples were doing any harm to this farmer's crop. In fact, there are a whole lot of rows of wheat still standing. They were simply going through and grabbing a couple of grains of wheat and husking them and popping them in their mouth, plucking them and popping them in their mouth. Um, in fact, God had even made accommodations for this type of action in his law. If you are hungry, you can go through a farmer's field and take a little bit just to take the edge off. In fact, he even had gleaning at the end of the season so that they could uh, help the poor and supply food for the poor that way. So what's the big deal here? Well, the big deal is that the Pharisees are being the Pharisees, and we're going to get to them in a second. But the big deal is, is that God had said, on the Sabbath, no work. You have to rest. And the Pharisees saw the disciples of Jesus going through the field plucking grains of, of plucking grains, plucking heads of grain. And the Pharisees interpreted this plucking as reaping, and reaping was work, and work was a serious offense on the Sabbath. So they figured something has to be done. 
Now, it's very easy for us to see the Pharisees as the old curmudgeons in this whole scene. But the truth of the matter is that they really were very serious about God's law, very dead serious about it. With the Sabbath law alone, the third commandment, with the Sabbath law alone, the Pharisees had created 39 other laws to surround this one law, almost like 39 fence posts, in order so that they could determine what was work and what was not. 39 additional fence post laws around the one Sabbath law to help them safeguard this one Sabbath law so that no one would get so close as to break the Sabbath or not break the Sabbath and keep the Sabbath pure. Well, they were so focused on keeping the Sabbath law pure and holy that they forgot the purpose of the Sabbath law and it turned them into legalists. That's right. It turned them into legalists. God's law came, became for them, and not just this one. God's entire law became for the Pharisees nothing more and certainly nothing less than a list of rules and regulations that you had to keep, thus pleasing God and thus essentially earning your own salvation. The Sabbath law had been reduced to nothing more than following a formula. No heart, no life. Children sitting in the back seat of a car are not the only people who have a hard time keeping the law or have a hard time with law. Adults like the Pharisees also have a hard time keeping them. Even if you have a rebel spirit within you, I think just under the surface, there is you, your rebel spirit supposedly, saying that you really like the law because there are laws that you really do enjoy. Just as for the Pharisees, these laws help you kind of guide the roadmap of your life and they make it a little bit clearer for you how to navigate your life in this world. You may not call them laws, but that's just what they are. Remember back, time, back to the last time you were at the grocery store. And you may have your own little system of how things are supposed to go down. What's your MO at the checkout line? This is how it's supposed to work. And then that other person came and totally blew your framework right out of the water. And boy, did it crank you off. But they were rude, not you, right? Parents of young children, you may enforce bedtime heavily, or you may just kind of be a little bit more flexible on that. But whatever it is, you know that there are people out there, parents with parenting skills, that don't match your own, right? In fact, their parenting skills, <coughs> excuse me, come awfully close to borderline unlawfulness. So you think. Um, you end up walking away feeling good, and they are the bad parent. But I think this one pretty much applies to all of us right now. Um, what about this day that we call the Sabbath for us? Now, it's not really the Sabbath we're allowed to worship anytime, but what about this day of rest we'll call it for us? This day when God simply says to you, I just want you to come and spend time with me. Hear my word. And how many times have you come to this house of the Lord with your own arbitrary rules in your back pocket? Right? The truth of the matter is, we are all Pharisees. And I say that as my wink... My, my finger is wagging, totally remembering the greatest lesson that Juanita Kuski ever taught me, that for my one finger wagging at you, yes, there are three wagging back at me. We all have our own laws of our own making. And they are not really about 
loving my fellow man by having good godly manners at the grocery store. The laws of our own making are not really about loving God by being a good parent. The laws of my own making are not about loving St. Paul by being a steadfast stalwart church member. No, these laws are about us. They're about our own self-righteousness because we figure if I like me and I'm happy with me, maybe God will be too, right? Jesus goes on and he answers the Pharisees, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar, here he's called Abiathar. In the Old Testament, you heard that he was Ahimelech, same guy, okay? No discrepancy here. In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat, and he also gave some to his companions. David and his men were on the run from Saul. That's the setting. And they were hungry and they were in need. And they went to Abiathar and Abiathar was breadless. So Abiathar gave them five of the 12 loaves of showbread or consecrated bread, which he should not have done. But he did it anyway. And this was bread, by the way, that only priests were allowed to eat and only after that bread had been rotated out after seven days. Abiathar, or Ahimelech, if you want to call him that, knew the law. And yet he gave this bread to David and his men anyway. The Son of Man, who is the Lord of the Sabbath, who gave this law, who knew the summary of the Ten Commandments very well to be, love God and love your neighbor. So what's Jesus' point in telling this account to the Pharisees? He's basically saying to them, lads, legalism has no place in God's church. Human need is of a higher consideration to God than your religious ritualism. And Abiathar, took care of that need that they had out of love for them. And that, brothers and sisters, is what we mean when we use the phrase, let the gospel predominate. Jesus then comes to his point. The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. One day out of seven, was supposed to be intended for blessing man. It was intended for God to be able to bless us. But God made it a law, the third commandment, because he knew our human nature. He intended this day, this Sabbath day, and now for what us in the New Testament happens to be Sunday. Why did we pick Sunday? Why did we move it from Saturday to Sunday? What happened on a Sunday? Jesus rose from the grave. What a great day to be able to celebrate our worship and our new life together. God intended this rest day to give them physical rest, yes. But it was also supposed to be a day that was set aside where they could worship God and hear his word and have their faith strengthened. But the Pharisees... The Pharisees had turned the Sabbath day into a day of following and keeping laws. 39 of them. Oh joy. The Pharisees ended up practicing a religion that was only outward in form. And they honestly believed or they were deluding themselves, which is what they were doing. But they believed that this was God-pleasing worship, that this formless and this, this heartless um, obedience was actually pleasing to God. 
do, 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 do 39 times on the Sabbath day. They had lost sight of the purpose of this day. They had lost sight of the purpose of the law. The Son of Man, who is the Lord of the Sabbath, who knew very well this third commandment, knew that it was a law with a law shell, but a gospel content. Restoring the weary, resting the bruised, replenishing the empty. That's the core of this day. Jesus need to, needed to make them understand by driving this home now, the true meaning of this day. So then, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Jesus was master, Jesus was Lord, and Jesus is the one who established rest. This would have said to the Pharisees, and you're thinking there with your cartoon balloon, this is great, but how does this relate to me? Because this son of man, who is the Lord of the Sabbath, is alive. And he is still Lord of the Sabbath. And he says to you, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And he can say things like that because he's kept the Sabbath law perfectly in your place. And he died for you on a cross. And before he died, he said, it is finished. Jesus' greatest work was resting in a tomb on the Sabbath for you. But not for long. Because then he burst forth from that tomb back to life to give us rest. This Lord of the Sabbath in this Lord of the Sabbath. There is rest from your sin. There is rest from your guilt. There is rest from the accusations of Satan against you. There is rest from your own self-justification and your own self-righteousness. There is rest from the law, the condemning, condemning accusations of the law. There is freedom. Because in Christ, you are loved by your Father and his Father. In Christ, you are forgiven. And in Christ, you are given the keys to the gates of heaven itself. So that one day you will soar, and you will live with him forever, and have eternal rest. This is your Lord of the Sabbath. This Jesus is the source of a deep, and a long-lasting rest that our weary souls need, ultimately, but even now. Rest that looks like him speaking to us through his word. Rest that rejuvenates us in his love. And rest that looks like restoration in his forgiveness. Rest happens in Christ because Christ is the Lord of rest. In the face of our self-justification this morning, in the face of our self-justification, Jesus in this gospel lesson points us back to himself. He shows you and he shows me what the law is really all about. Living love. Let that one sink in because it has impacted you personally and greatly and magnificently. This living love has taken up residence in your heart and given you the Sabbath, a Sabbath rest. Sabbath is now the state of your relationship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All thanks to the Son of Man, who is still Lord of the Sabbath, who is also known as the Christ, 
whose name is Jesus, who is your dear Savior. In that peace, live in this Sabbath rest. Amen. Please rise. The peace of God, which surpasses all and every understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus, your Sabbath Lord. Amen. I invite you now to take up your service worship folder, turn to page 7, and join with me in confessing this ancient creed of the church, the Nicene. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The congregation may be seated for the collection of the offering. If you're a visitor, please do not feel obligated to help support our ministry. If you wish to, that's your choice. And if you are a visitor, I would like you to acquaint yourself with our communion practice. It's in that box on the top of page 9 of your worship folder. At this time, I would like to invite forward Lena and Jem and Richard and Riley, please, to come on up here. And go ahead and just stand right up here. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our Lord Jesus said to his disciples, all authority in heaven and earth 
has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so in obedience to our Lord's command, you have all been baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You have been taught the precious truths of the Christian faith as confessed by the Evangelical Lutheran Church. You know what God has given you by his grace and what he expects of you as his dear ch children. You now have the privilege of receiving the Lord's body and blood in the sacrament of Holy Communion. And so you are here to make a public profession of your Christian faith. The Apostle Paul writing to the Romans said, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Therefore, lift up your hearts to the God of all grace and joyfully answer these questions. Do the four of you this day in the presence of God and of this congregation acknowledge that in baptism God gave you forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation? If so, answer, I do. Do you reject the devil along with all his lies and empty promises? If so, answer, I do. I do. Do you believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit as summarized in the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, and suffered under Pontius Pilate, who was crucified, died, and was buried, who descended into hell and on the third day rose again from the dead, who ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and from there will come to judge the living and the dead. And you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting? If so, answer, I do. Do you believe all the books of the Bible to be the inspired word of God? If so, answer, I do. Do you believe that the teaching of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, as you have learned to know it from Luther's small catechism, is faithful and true to the Word of God? If so, answer, I do. Do you intend to continue steadfast in this teaching and to endure all things, even death, rather than fall away from it? If so, answer, I do, and I ask God to help me. Do you intend faithfully to conform all your life to the teaching of God's word, to be faithful in the use of word and sacraments, and in faith and action remain true to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as long as you live? If so, answer, I do, and I ask God to help me. Since it is God alone, brothers and sisters of St. Paul, who enables us both to will and to do his good pleasure, it is right for us, dear friends in Christ, to call on him for these confirmands that he would graciously complete the good work which he has begun in them. Let us therefore bow our heads and pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your great goodness in bringing these sons and daughters of yours to the knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ and in giving them both hearts to believe and mouths to confess his saving name. Enable them to bring forth the fruits of faith and to continue steadfast and victorious until the day comes when all who have fought the good fight of faith shall receive the crown of righteousness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, may God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, give you his Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and knowledge, and of grace and prayer, of power and strength, of sanctification, and the fear of God. Your, con your congregation now invites you to receive the sacrament of the Lord's body and blood. Accept this invitation with deep reverence and holy joy. 
Regard your communing at the Lord's table as a precious privilege given you by God through his church. And so receive the sacrament thankfully and often. The almighty and merciful God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless and keep you. Welcome to, officially to your family here at St. Paul. And we can say welcome to his well. Their names are Elena. There you go. Jen. And. There you go. And we'll see you at the communion rail. That's found on page eight. Please stand. Holy Father, you have provided for your people a place of rest in your Son, Jesus Christ. Remember your church throughout all the world and give to your baptized children a rich share in your light and in your presence. Lord, in your mercy. Through the preaching of your son's victory, you have made your light to shine in our hearts. Bless the proclamation of all the servants of your word, shining the light of Christ to all the world. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Hope of the heavy hearted, remember in your love all who are afflicted in any way, that they may not be crushed, the perplexed, that they may not despair, the persecuted, that they may not be forsaken, and those struck down, that they may not be destroyed. Lord, in your mercy. Father of glory, your Son revealed himself as the Lord of love. He sets before his own, rich, his own a rich feast in which he still does us good, inviting us to receive the very ransom price of our salvation, his true body and blood. Help all who come to the altar today to rest in his promises and to revel in his love. Lord, in your mercy. Source of all being life, receive our grateful praise for all those who died trusting in the Savior's mercy and so live in him forevermore. As we await the day of the resurrection when the Spirit will cause the life of Jesus to be fully manifested in our mortal bodies, fill us with hope and joyful expectation. Lord, in your mercy. And Heavenly Father, in prayer this morning, we come before you. We thank you for the surgery that Judy Folger has gone through for her neck. And we pray that you continue to be with her through her recovery. Continue to place people that encourage her with the gospel around her, especially her brothers and sisters here at St. Paul. Lead us to continue to support her and reach out to her. We also pray for Pastor Getzinger's mother, Carol Lee, who has just begun chemo for cancer. We pray that you continue to watch over her and all the doctors and nurses and people that are in that process of healing her and putting her through this process. We also pray that you continue to put Christians around her that share the gospel with her, that encourage her, and that let her know how desperately important it is in this time to rest in the promises of God. We also come before you with prayers of thanksgiving for Jem who has been baptized today and for everyone that's been confirmed. We thank you for your means of grace that create faith in dead hearts. We thank you for your word that washes away sin and that writes our names in the book of life. And we thank you for that word that draws us together as one loaf, that draws us together as one family. Continue to watch over our new brothers and sister and continue to help us to encourage them and to be with them and to help carry their burdens. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. In a few moments, we'll be inviting forward confirmed members of St. Paul and our sister congregations in the wells to take part in the sacrament. If you are a guest with us today and you've not had an opportunity yet to speak to Pastor Getzinger or myself, we humbly request that you don't come up at this point but you remain in the pews and join in the singing. This is not a judgment of your Christian faith in any way. It is simply in keeping with the way that our Lord has instructed us to observe and carry out his sacrament in scripture. 
If you've got any questions at all about this ancient practice, Pastor Getzinger or myself, we would love to have the opportunity to talk to you about it after church, maybe downstairs over a cup of tea. Let's turn now to that service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who has called us to be his own so that we may live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and we join their glorious song. Blessed are you, O Lord of heaven and earth. We praise and thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ. And we remember the great acts of love through which he has ransomed us from sin, death, and the devil's power. By his incarnation, he became one with us. By his perfect life, he fulfilled your holy will. By his innocent death, he overcame hell. By his rising from the grave, he opened heaven. Invited by your grace and instructed by your word, we approach your table with repentant and joyful hearts. Strengthen us through Christ's body and blood and preserve us in the true faith until we feast with him and all his ransomed people in glory everlasting. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then after supper, he took the cup, he gave thanks, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood, the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please be seated.
At this time, I'd like to direct your eyes to the top of page 12, where we will conclude our morning of miracles here. Please stand. Let's join together in the Nunc Dementis. thanks, O Lord, for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet that you have given us to eat and to drink in this sacrament. Through this gift, you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your Spirit, help us to live as your holy people till that day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. And we'll remain standing as we sing the final stanza of hymn 747, but it's printed for you right there in the worship folder. You may be seated for just a moment. Good morning again. Welcome to all of you. Welcome to any visitors who are with us. Please take the time to introduce yourself to Pastor Thompson and me on your way out and join us for some refreshments downstairs. I have no announcements for you other than Pastor Thompson and I will be out of country for three days for district convention, returning sometime Wednesday evening. Any announcements from you? I'm sure I, I do, but I don't remember. I've just... Okay, it's one of those mornings. Yeah. Okay, we all have them. So. Uh, Jem and Lena and Richard, I would invite you to join us in the back so your brothers and sisters can uh, greet you to St. Paul. Have a blessed week in Christ. <laughs>